Welcome back, everybody. His stock surged yesterday after Moderna's CEO reported progress on its vaccine candidate right here on Squawk Box. Joining us right now is Dr. Scott Gottlieb. He is former FDA commissioner. He's also a CNBC contributor, and he serves on the boards of Illumina and Pfizer. And Dr. Gottlieb, we have the privilege of getting to talk to you every day about all the big events, things that are happening on this front when it comes to coronavirus. Um, we had spoken with you just before we spoke with the Moderna CEO yesterday. And, and so this is the first time we really get a chance to ask you about your thoughts on what happened. Obviously, the idea that there could be a candidate that works, a vaccine candidate that works in early trials is incredibly exciting. We kind of watched that play out in real time yesterday with the market closing up by more than 900 points at the end of the day. But this was a, a small study. Phase one, they said eight out of eight people who took this did develop the antibodies after taking two doses of that vaccine. And I just wonder how, how you look at this as a doctor and as, as someone who was head of the FDA, understanding the, the complications that can come as you try and get a, a product to market. Right. Well, you're absolutely right. It's a very early study. It's a positive development. It shows that this vaccine can produce an immune response. Remember, before this, we weren't sure that these mRNA constructs would produce a robust immune response. So they saw a dose effect. The higher the dose here, the more antibodies that were produced. They saw antibodies in 45 out of 45 patients. Now, they only tested the first eight patients to determine whether they're neutralizing antibodies. So we need to know the data on the other patients and whether, in fact, those are neutralizing antibodies, the kinds of antibodies that target the virus and destroy the virus. Um, but we're going to get that data hopefully soon. Now, they saw in their highest dose um, some fevers. So it looks like they're discontinuing that dose, the 250 microgram dose. In the lowest dose, their 25 microgram dose, it looks like the immune effect wasn't robust enough. So it doesn't look like they're taking that forward. So they're testing a 100 microgram dose and now a 50 microgram dose, which is what they're adding. And it just goes to speak to the fact that there's a lot of work ahead. Um, they need to figure out what the right dose is for this vaccine. So they're going to need to do a lot of phase two work before they can get into a phase three trial to determine the optimal dose, because I don't think they're going to be able to pull forward into a big phase three clinical trial, multiple doses. So they're going to have to do a lot of work ahead to figure out what the right dose is. And we also have to make sure that these vaccines are producing neutralizing antibodies. How, how difficult, how complicated is that, just figuring out if, if this gives you um, immunity? And, and, and then again, the question of how long that immunity might last. Well, we're not going to know if it's really giving you immunity until we do the big phase three program and look at the clinical effect. We assume that if a vaccine's producing neutralizing antibodies, then that's going to confer some level of immunity. We don't know how long it's going to last. It looks like perhaps a year. This might be the kind of vaccine, and all these vaccines might be the kinds of vaccines that you need to redose every year. And the immunity might not be absolute. The immunity might prevent you from getting very sick from COVID. It might prevent you from getting COVID the disease. But you might still get the infection, sort of like the way a flu shot works. You can still get the flu if you have a flu shot, but typically you'll get a less severe infection. And that's the way the coronavirus vaccines might work. In terms of the work that this company has to do, they'll have to conduct a number of phase 2A and 2B studies, is my hunch, to figure out what that right dose is. And they're also going to have to conduct those studies in the target population, which is an older population. These studies were done in a younger population, um, people who would get the vaccine probably if it was available, but they'll have to look at older adults as well before they go into a big phase three program. So it's not clear when they would start that phase three. I know they said July. I think there's work to be done before they can get into a phase three. Joe, I know you had some questions too. I did. Uh, so doctor, the, this was a phase one uh, trial. It's not that big. And these were interim results. Is that normal to release positive early data from an interim phase one, and then I'll ask you a follow-up for that, but is there anything unusual about that? You have a problem with that? Well, it was a little unusual in that they didn't release the quantitative data on the antibody response. So if you look at the data they released on their CMV vaccine a while back, they released a lot of data on the bottom line um, tighter levels of what, what the antibody response was. This time they didn't have that data available. Also, you would have thought that they might have waited until they had data on all the 45 patients with respect to those neutralizing antibodies. The, the NIH is doing that work. They're the ones testing to see if the patients are developing neutralizing antibodies. So you would have thought that they would have waited until that data set was complete. There might have been reasons why they felt they needed to disclose this on Monday. Um, but we're going to probably get that more complete data set soon. You would assume that if the first eight patients they tested had neutralizing antibodies, maybe all 45 didn't, but you would assume that some complement of the additional 45 will. And I think that's why people were reacting positively yeah. and looking at this as a positive development. 
Because we asked yesterday, Becky asked, uh, how's, the, how's your cash? Are you going to need to raise money? Uh, it, so they got a big bump in the stock, obviously, yesterday. And then there was a public offering announced after the close. I don't think it's for selling shareholders. I think it's for general corporate purposes. But the timing, uh, that's why I ask you whether it's typical to release interim data, because you know that immediately people that are caught on the wrong side of this, people that have whatever reason that they have for, for a nine, looking at a 900-point gain in a market they already think is overvalued, they're immediately going to say, look, this is, uh, this, you work for Pfizer, or you're on the board of Pfizer. Would Pfizer right. release an interim study early in the morning and then announce a stock offering after the close, after their stock ro uh, ran up? Well, look, the bigger companies are in different, different positions in terms of their cash position, and also they tend to be more conservative than the smaller biotech companies, and we've long known that. I think why people are enthusiastic, and we have to put this data in perspective, it's early, it's speculative, but I think why people are enthusiastic generally is we now have a number of data cards we've turned over on a number of different vaccines, both in preclinical and now some clinical data, that suggests that we'll get a vaccine to coronavirus, that it's possible to develop a vaccine against this virus. And I think that that's a reasonable statement to make at this point, that okay. we should be able to develop a vaccine against this virus at some point. Now, I think the timing is questionable, whether or not we can have it before the end of the year or whether or not we're going to have to wait until 2021 to have a product that we can use more generally. All right, I got one more uh, question just about the overall uh, messenger RNA therapy. And a couple of years ago, this company came under some criticism for being kind of a black box, where they didn't share exactly how things were working with, with the messenger RNA. Not, and, I, and I hesitate to use the T word, the Theranos word, but it's actually there have been comparisons four or five years ago to the way that they were keeping a, a close lid on their research uh, and, and whether they could actually prove it in, uh, in clinical studies. In the meantime, independent researchers and bigger companies like Pfizer, would you say that they have proven the, the platform of a vaccine coming from messenger RNA? Do you, do you think we can at least put that to rest, that this, is, uh, you know, that this is not something that can actually be done? There is hope that this might work? I think it's a fair statement, Joe. I think, we, I think there's hope that this can work. We don't have a clinical product yet on the market as a result of these kinds of platforms, but there's a lot of companies working on these. I think we validate them, certainly in preclinical, and now some clinical models. It is interesting to make an observation that if you look at the Chinese vaccines that they're developing, with the exception of one of those vaccines, which is an adenoviral vector vaccine, similar to what J&J &J is doing, the other three are inactivated viruses, a very old traditional approach to vaccine development. So they're not taking these novel approaches that we are, where we're using adenoviral vectors or protein vaccines, DNA vaccines, and mRNA vaccines. Um, we're generally taking more novel approaches to the development of a vaccine. That may turn out to be good. We may get vaccines that are more immunogenic, uh, develop, that, that develop a more robust antibody response, or it may create more risk and uncertainty. And we don't know the answer to that question yet.